Okay, welcome to a short introduction to the E2 mechanism. Uh, you'll find other videos on my site that include the E1 mechanism as well, but I'm going to focus strictly on E2 in this case to demonstrate how making a small change to a reaction can drastically affect the mechanism by which it proceeds. Uh, I'm going to start by defining a few things. First is a base. Uh, when I say base during this lecture, I'm talking about a Lewis base which has lone pair electrons it can donate uh, to form a new bond. Now it can act as a Bronsted-Lowry base, uh, extracting a proton by doing so. So we're going to watch for that as we go through our E2 reaction. Next is an alpha proton. Now that's the proton that's adjacent to a carbon that we're really interested in. In our, this case, the electrophilic carbon. So alpha protons will be one carbon away from that site. And finally, the leaving group. Uh, this would be the substituent which easily withdraws its bonding electrons and can let go of the electrophilic carbon and essentially go off on its own and form a stable species. So let's think about the SN2 reaction first. Uh, SN2 reactions are favored uh, with good nucleophiles, less substituted substrates, and poor leaving groups. Now, uh, If any of this sounds unfamiliar to you, I suggest that you watch the SN1, SN2 video on my YouTube channel at Chem Survival. Some factors which favor the SN1 reactions are exactly the opposite. That would be poor nucleophiles, more substituted substrates, and good leaving groups. So if we have a reaction like, let's say we're dealing with a reaction between hydroxide ion, indicated on the left here, and methyl chloride, uh, represented on the right here. We'd be dealing with a situation where we have a strong nucleophile, an unobstructed electrophilic carbon, and a poor leaving group. So we have all the recipe conditions that we need for an SN2 to occur, and none of what we need for SN1. So it's very clear what's going to happen here when this reaction starts. Our nucleophile is going to want to attack, and our leaving group is not going to want to go. So the leaving group will not depart until nucleophilic attack occurs. In this case, because the electrophile is unobstructed, nucleophilic attack can go through easily. But let's rewind this reaction and make one change and see what happens. Now what I'm going to do with my reaction here is I'm going to change only the substitution of the electrophile. I've created what would essentially be T-butyl chloride in this case if it were analogous to our previous molecule. So what I've done is I've switched from an unobstructed electrophile to an obstructed electrophile. And in doing so I've changed one of the three conditions to favor SN1 instead of SN2. So now I have a situation where my conditions are conflicting. My nucleophile and leaving group are prime for SN2, but my substrate is prime for SN1. So what's going to happen here? Neither one of these reactions can really run well. So my nucleophile wants to get in there and do some chemistry, but the leaving group says, I'm not going anywhere until you make me. But unlike in our previous example, our nucleophile cannot displace the leaving group for a backside attack. So it needs to find another way to initiate departure of the leaving group. And the way that it does this is it looks to the alpha proton. The alpha proton can be abstracted because remember nucleophiles tend to have the same properties as bases, that is high negative charge density and available lone pairs for bonding. So my nucleophile can instead act as a base and when it does so it will abstract the alpha proton causing a cascade of electron flow through molecular orbitals which ultimately will lead to the formation of an alkene and the departure of the leaving group. The base will almost always attack whichever alpha proton is at a 180 degree dihedral from the leaving group. This is because the molecular orbitals in that orientation are properly aligned for that, that electron flow to occur. So let's watch that happen. You can see that by removing the proton, I've created a pi bond and therefore synthesized an alkene in, in the process of displacing the leaving group. And we'll talk a little bit more about the geometry of uh, different E and Z isomers which can form in E2 reactions a little bit later. As you can see, we've used a very simple substrate this time. But this is a great example of how altering just one condition can dramatically change the mechanism by which a reaction proceeds. That's it for now. I'll see everybody next time.